love lives here. Good morning once again. Thank you, Jabelle. Thank you, Constance. I know we're having some trouble there once again with the sound from the center. My apologies to everyone. We are working on it. Matt is trying to figure it out from behind the scenes there. So um, we're trusting that everything unfolds and is continuing to unfold uh, in divine right order and divine right timing as it should. So uh, thank you all. So thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, this, like I said, it is the second Sunday in July. We are working with our uh, monthly theme of Unchained Spirituality, and we are talking today with Tammy Lambert about none of us are free until all of us are free. But before we bring Tammy in and we start this wonderful conversation, I do want us to come together and let us breathe life and let us um, really speak the word of our focus statement into existence, shall we? So here we are, let's do this together. We embolden people to live their highest potential through the transformative power of love. Say it one more time. We embolden people to live their highest potential through the transformative power of love. So many of you will remember Tammy. Tammy was with us last year. And so let me just refresh uh, your memories as to who this beloved is that is joining us this morning. So Tammy Lambert is a practitioner and ministerial intern at Rio Grande Center for Spiritual Living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She is an enrolled member of the Jicaria Apache Nation in New Mexico, but she grew up here in Southern California and spent much of her teen and young adult years in Riverside and in San Bernardino County. She earned a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of New Mexico in 1996, and then earned her Juris Doctorate from the same institution in 1999. And she focused on federal Indian law. Tammy has been a licensed attorney in New Mexico for 20 years, has been the head of a state office and was a policy advisor to the state governor as well as tribal governors. She has successfully lobbied for legislation on a federal, state and local levels. She is currently the presiding judge for a Native American tribe in New Mexico. Her personal commitment is to create a world that is powerfully conscious and transforming itself in every area of life, including government, courts, the private sector, and any other area where there is a potential for making a positive difference. So please give Tammy a warm Riverside Center for Spiritual Living welcome and welcome Tammy Lambert. Yay, Tammy. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi. Good morning, Reverend Jeffrey. Good. How are you? I'm We're going to turn good. up our volume on it here over here so I can hear you better. There okay. we go. Hi. All right. <laughs> Hi. So it's so great to see you. Great. Thank you for being with us this morning. It's always good to see you all. And I just love the Riverside community. It uh, feels like home. <laughs> ah, thank you. So um, this topic that we have today is none of us are free until all of us are free. And I, when I was contemplating this topic and, you know, thinking about who I would love to chat with about this particular um, topic, your name immediately came to mind because you are walking in the world as a religious person, as a ministerial intern with Centers for Spiritual Living, and yet you also walk in the world as a judge for uh, a Native American tribe there in New Mexico. Okay. And then you walk in the world with all these other very beautiful intersectionalities. And so I was like, you know, this is the perfect topic. I would love to hear what Tammy has to say about none of us are free until all of us are free. So mm -hmm. why don't we start there? What does that phrase mean for you? Well, it speaks to oneness. And uh, the thing is, is that whenever we talk about oneness, it's always the ultimate answer of any science of mind question. Uh, it's always, you know, when I was in law school, they used to have a, an answer. The answer in law school was always, it depends. And the answer in science of mind is always oneness, right? There's one answer and it's oneness. Um, so the question is, what do we do with the oneness and how do we relate to it? 
Um, and how do we deal with race consciousness that has in this country a background of, of, of some rather dismal oppression? So how do we not do a spiritual bypass and still be in a space of talking about oneness and still deal with the broken leg that America seems to be showing up with right now? So the idea of we're not free until all are free is a testament to the conversation that we're all inherently connected. Um, but the thing is, is that many of us are not experiencing freedom. You know, sometimes in America, people think that um, being free means being left alone to do whatever you want. And that's not actually what I mean by freedom. Uh, what I mean is uh, by freedom is not just the temporal contemporary experience, but a true freedom of the, of the spirit and a true freedom of the soul and a true, true freedom of the body. Um, but we have these circumstances right now that do not appear that way, right? So when we say when some are, you know, if, so if one is not free, all is not free, what that means to me is that we just have our work ahead of us. I also am very interested in this, this phrase, uh, we are brought into this kingdom for such a time as this. It's from the book of Esther. And, you know, you think about who we are as beings, you know, we create, we were created or evolved or somehow we're here having this human experience. You consider, you know, a thousand million years of the cosmos evolving to this moment right here. And the, the miracle it is to be a spiritual being having this human experience. And while I'm having this experience, I am brought here into this time to do the soul development that is brought to me by these social constructs. In other words, I am here right now as whatever I'm made up to be to for a specific dharmic purpose, and it is divine. And if I wanna know what my purpose is, I just have to look around me. Right. And now I'm 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 a strange fellow. I'm an um, I'm an expert at being an outsider. So I'm African American, I'm Native American, I'm you know, I'm married to a woman, I'm you know, getting older, you know, I have all these unique differences. And what I do with those differences is that they inform because I'm always at the right place at the right time. And I'm always the one that was called to be there to cause something profound. So I look to all of the things that are showing up in my life at all times. And I know that I am the right answer. I am spirit's answer to this moment. So when I look around me and I see that people are not free, it brings to me my personal responsibility, my purpose for being in this pinprick of eternity right now. And I, it opens me up to the uh, perennial question of what is mine to do, knowing that who I am and what I bring is perfect in every moment. So if I'm free, then I, my, my sole purpose is to contribute to the freedom of the people around me. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I think that's really important that, you know, if we turn within first and we experience our freedom first, that we, it comes back to that oneness and it comes back to remembering who we are and really the truth of our being. And then it's an opportunity then to express that freedom, to express that truth out into the greater world and to bring, um, well, kind of to be a way shower or a light bearer, if you will, to really lift the consciousness and lift people around us to show them what's possible. You know, like we say, we embolden people to live their highest potential through the transformative power of love. When we say that, we're saying that about ourselves, <clears throat> that we're emboldening ourselves, but also from that place of groundedness that we're aiding others in emboldening themselves to live their highest potential as well. So I'm curious with you being a minister or almost minister, I can't wait to, to see that REV in front of your name, <laughs> um, but you're already doing great ministry in the world already. You have been for so long, but how do you, Bring that bring your ministerial consciousness to your work as a judge for the Native American tribe that you serve, the Pueblo that you serve. Well, consciousness can't be uh, compartmentalized. So wherever I am is wherever, however, and whoever I am. So it's it's unavoidable. Um, but the question becomes one of um, what I'm buying into. 
Um, and so one of the things that's been real useful is the idea is the ability to say, I am in this role, but I'm in the world and not of it. Right. So I'm in this role. It doesn't define me or create who I am. I am the creator. The creator is divining through me. And so whatever I am putting my hand to is absolutely blessed. Right. So as when I sit as a judge, one of the things that I bring is I'm always a practitioner. So when I listen to defendants or when I listen to people who are struggling with, you know, family issues or probate issues, my intention is to always approach that from the space of being a practitioner, meaning I see the God in you. I see the God in you as a human being that is struggling with this particular path and you have an obstacle in front of you. And so my job is to listen to you as that divine being and also see that, you know, we all have our different paths. And one of the things that's shown up a lot is, you know, we think about the criminal justice system and, you know, how do I say, and someone asked me, how do you sit as a judge and, you know, as a practitioner and put people in jail? And I'm like, hey, you know what? There's a divine peace and divine order and there's no peace without order. But it's not my intent to um, punish people because I understand from a spiritual point of view that everyone is on their own lesson. The divine, the divine creator is not out there to punish me. And so I, as an expression of divine creator, am I not out there to punish others. I will set limits, however. And one of the things that I've noticed is that people are often, I, I started noticing on my, in my criminal um, issues that I kept putting people in jail for violating probation and parole terms. And it was because they were struggling with drug and alcohol issue, issues that had not been addressed. And when you look at the incarceration in the country, if you look at, for example, even African-American incarceration rates, which are like five to one of white folks, you look at there's often this whole background of drugs and, and drug dealing and drug possession and all of this. And I thought, this is a, a, a product of historical trauma. This is not bad people. These are people who are dealing with what we are all dealing with, which is the historical oppression in this country that has been designed to oppress the spirit as well as the body. And so when I see people presenting with this issue, my response is to get them into treatment. So we started, we created, we wrote a lot of grants and we started a healing to wellness court, which is basically a holistic approach to surrounding people with services, having a multiple disciplinary team that um, surrounds the, um, the person to where they're getting service, they're getting service to death. They're just getting, I, and, and everyone in the community is surrounding them with these services. And so what that did was it showed us that in our native communities, that we're not kind of like the broader community where everyone can just be put in jail and thrown away. Because every single member of the tribe, every single, single member of the community is inherently valuable and they can't be replaced. So having them um, surrounded with services, we're committed to, their, to the restitution of their restoration of who they are, because we know who they are. And so having this community has absolutely created an ability to cause a healing to wellness, which is the name of the court. Instead of sending people to jail for drug possession, we're bringing them back into the arms of the community. And then what that does is it changes the listening of the community for that person because the community has invested in them. It also changes the person's experience of themselves and their experience of the criminal justice system. Now, there are times where people will just, you know, blow it off and I have to set a hard limit. But it's not my intention to put people in jail forever. And if someone has to be pretty violent for them to go there for long. If someone's willing to address the issues of domestic violence or substance or drug abuse, or maybe they need counseling, we're going that way first. And so it, 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 it isn't what I see in, the, uh, in some of the state and federal systems. We're talking about punishing and throwing people away. We're actually focused on, we see the God in you and we are standing for you to see the God in you. And it also starts to involve the community who then has to relate to that person differently as well. So there's a healing all around. And so that's kind of the beauty of working in a tribal community is that there's an experience of community. Beautiful. <clears throat> and that really speaks to a lot of the principles that we teach 
here as well. <clears throat> you know, that it's, that it's when we approach things that it's more from a restorative place rather than a punitive place, right? Right. So <clears throat> can you say a little bit more about the restorative justice system that you are part of there um, in New Mexico? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the uh, community that I work in is a, is a small community, but we also are surrounded by other tribes and pueblos who are facing similar issues. And so what we do the same approach on whether or not someone's a member of the um, tribe or another member of the tribe. The restorative is, as I mentioned, it's the, the idea that someone is already whole, perfect, and complete, and that what we're doing is we're um, bringing their realization of that to their mind. Um, and one of the ways that we are doing that is we have counseling and we have, um, you know, a lot of um, different step programs and there are things that are culturally, we're looking for culturally appropriate services. And one of the things that has been showing up as a modality is also mindfulness as a, um, as a way to approach um, sobriety. Um, and so my mindfulness, we know it as meditation, but, you know, secular mindfulness, it, uh, it, it, it um, attacks the same parts of the brain as, as or impacts the same part of the brain as, as spiritual mindfulness. Um, and so what we're doing is we're actually committed to people knowing who they are. And so what we've done is we've created that the actual courtroom is a healing place. Um, it's not a punitive place. There are limits and we will enforce orders. But that doesn't mean that our focus is on finding someone wrong. We're more interested in finding a space of healing. Now, people are all at different stages of their realization of that. But restoration means, it doesn't mean fixing someone. It doesn't make meaning making them better. It's a return to their own divinity. And uh, when and because we are a tribal community, that one community that I'm working in does have those same values, we're able to focus more on restoration and uh, safety. Now, there are times where people do need safe spaces. Um, for example, domestic violence victims may need safe spaces and all of that. We will follow all those rules, um, but we will also um, be looking to um, having people uh, engage in more treatment and therapy and things like that. Um, sometimes there are things that need to be done to restore the community physically. Sometimes you have um, low-level crimes like um, vandalism and things like that. And uh, we engage with the tribal leaders and have the um, people, uh, you know, uh, restore it. There was one young man, he was a teen, and he was tagging the skating park. And, uh, you know, we had him engaged with, he had to work to pay for the money for the paint. And then he was overseen by a tribal leader as he, you know, got that work restored. And what that did was it not only had him be fiscally responsible for it, he was physically responsible for it. And then he connected with someone in the community who then had an interest in a relationship with him. Um, and so that's an example of restorative where um, this could have been a gateway crime that could have led to a young man being engaged in a system. Um, and it, what it actually did was it in, ended up con, uh, connecting him with community on a deeper level. Right, so <clears throat> that's really beautiful. I mean, it's so beautiful to see how, you know, a different approach, how approaching things from a wholeness perspective and bringing this young man back into kind of an awareness of who he truly is and then connecting him with the community, you know, in such a way of being able to take responsibility for his actions. Because what we know is that when we take responsibility, right, then we have that it empowers us to make other choices, right? Yeah. And so, and that also when we take responsibility for ourselves, then there's also some freedom that comes with that as well, yeah. because we're freeing ourselves from, those limitations that maybe we've bought into, um, you know, personally bought into some of those limitations and lack. And I, you know, it's so beautiful to hear you talk about how the community really comes together and that it's a restoration, not just of the individual, but of the community as well. And that everything is rooted in wholeness and that it's about reminding um, the individual of their wholeness and seeing their wholeness there and then calling them back to that and then engaging the community for the community then to you know, provide that wraparound and provide that interest 
um, to then and provide that connection because connection is so important, right? With all of this, it's that it's that deeper connection that we have with one another when we recognize that all of us are inherently one, going back to your oneness, that all of us are inherently one um, so that there is no separation, that there is no other rising. And so then when we come to that idea that there is no other rising, there is no other, then the whole approach shifts, doesn't it? It does. And, you know, the thing that came up for me was um, inside of the otherizing, we've noticed that sometimes families need support in being able to re-see uh, the person who's been the defendant. They may have dealt with that person's relapses or their continual, you know, entry into the system. And so it's interesting that not only is it the person that needs to be healed, it's the community who has had to shift and 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 do some spiritual actual and psychological movement to be able to do that. Um, and so sometimes we offer, you know, counseling or, or other services to family members as well. Well, I think that's true in almost any context. You have the person who has been feeling victimized and oppressed, and you have the person who's been on the other end of that, who may have done the victimizing or oppression. And, and both sides have to engage in that healing. Um, and so it's kind of a spiritual bypass to say, oh, you victim um, or you uh, community member have to do the healing or just the defendant doing the healing. And, and you look at it in a wider social context, you know, you look at people, you know, there's a lot of Black Lives Matter conversations and there are lots, a lot of issues with race and over imprisonment of people of color. And it's like, who has to be the one to do the healing in this matter? And it's everybody. Right. And that's what, you know, the whole theme of this is how can one be free if all are not free? And so it doesn't matter what end of the spectrum we are all on. There's actually no end and no beginning because we're all in this cosmic soup together. And so as long as one person is engaging in healing, we actually I believe that we create an alchem kind of like an alchemy of healing that can reach out to others. And you had talked earlier about, um, you know, doing our own spiritual work and then going out into the community and doing it as well. I believe that those th two things have to happen hand in hand, that I cannot do my own spiritual cleansing and healing and purification and my spiritual development without also reaching into your hand and doing it with you as well. Sometimes people think we, we do our spiritual process on our own and I'm fine, so, you know, I try not to, I ignore the world, right? When in actuality, my process is not complete if yours is not, yes. right? And that's what I mean about we are brought into this time for such a time as this. I'm put into this little cosmic soup right now. And sometimes the soup is a little bitter, right? And so what is my job? Well, my job is wherever I am to cause a divine light to operate through me and I surrender to it until that I can cause the rest of the sweetening, sweetening of that soup rather than just focusing inward. Um, and I think that's that can be a rather narcissistic point of view, but sometimes we think that that's our job is to mind our own business and ignore the world, um, which I think is a dereliction of our spiritual duty. I think that the oneness does mean that we're all in it together. Absolutely. You and I had talked um, last week about um, collective karma and versus individual karma. Can you, uh, and from an Ernest Holmes perspective, can you share with our folks here um, more about that? Yes, well, you know, uh, karma isn't a word that you see used a lot in Science of Mind, but Ernest Holmes did use it. And he said, we have a collective and an individual karma. And that inside of the idea of race consciousness, like as in the human race consciousness, that we are all, that there is a, a record or an energy form that's all things that have ever happened and all things that are happening now. And it's all kind of like rolling down this big river highway of race consciousness, unless we're actually like taking effort to transmute ourselves out of that flow, we're rolling along with everybody else, right? So it takes an active, self-aware, higher thought to transmute ourselves out of that flow. Well, right now, the flow of America has been pretty dismal. The flow of America has been oppression. It's been, 
you know, w greed and hatred. And there's just, you know, I can go into delineating it. We all know how ugly it has been. And as a, you know, woman of color, a woman, a black native <laughs> lesbian person, you can imagine I can like go down with a bunch of histories. And I'm sure so many people have their own stories and histories of that. And that is in the race consciousness of humanity in this country, if not in this world. So there is a karma of this country that is rolling down that river. And so what does it take for us to elevate and transmute ourselves out of those, out of that flow? And it takes the divine presence of oneness, this divine presence that we, that we invoke to lift ourselves out of that karma because karma is never about punishment. Karma is about, you're gonna keep repeating the cycle until you learn the lesson. So how do we learn that lesson? One of the first things we do in learning to have that lesson is acknowledging that there's something to learn, right? So I'm always quoting Guy Williams, one of our professors who says, you can't heal what you can't acknowledge. So acknowledging that something has been very wrong in this country and continues to be, right? Mm -hmm. And we can go into it. We can look at what's going on with you know, the, with the deportation, we can look at what's going on with immigration. We can look at going on with Black Lives Matter. We can look at the racism and the Confederate flags. And the, I mean, it's, it's the flow of race consciousness. What does it take to us for us to learn the lesson? First step, acknowledge that something is not right. I say not right because by right, I mean the highest divine intention for who we are is in divine beings. So if we can acknowledge this flow, instead of being, oh, I'm colorblind and I don't see your color and there's nothing wrong and I'm gonna ostrich about it. Mm -hmm. If we can acknowledge that something is not right and has not been and does not match the highest divine intention for who we are, then we can start to learn the lesson of it, identify any pieces in us that would have bought into that flow, and then we can transmute the energy to a different and higher plane. We do this with our prayer, our meditation, our soul searching, our prayer treatments, our constantly being in classes and learning and evolving so that we're on a different higher plane. And as we start to be who we are here, we energize and magnify that and we draw people to us who are also seeking that higher level of consciousness. And we become that, we are that, we draw that, we attract that, we bring the law of attraction to what it actually is, which is divine high intention. So we transmute the energy. And when we're able to do that, we're able to cause a shift out of this low energy, the shadow of America, and we're able to cause who we really are in this divine perfection. So the karma of this country is going to keep rolling down that river. But the karma, we can, we can jump out of that. We can do a cosmic shift out of that with our highest intention and our higher level vibration. So we stop the karmic cycle by learning the lesson. So in that way, it's almost, I would argue, it's impossible to do your spiritual work just for you because our job is to lift it, right? And if we're, and there's no middle ground, there's no, oh, I'm just hiding out with racism and sexism and I'm, I'm neutral. There's no neutral. You're either rolling down the racist river or you're an anti-racist and you're causing a shift in consciousness. And there's no middle ground. People think there is, but the status quo is so organized in this country around oppression that it takes a cosmic leap to get out of it. We need a quantum shift. And that's what we're causing right now. Absolutely. And I think we're, you know, we're really poised here at Centers for Spiritual Living to do that with the mm -hmm. way we approach life, the way we approach spirit, the way we approach, um, you know, our own humanity, but also our own divinity and yeah. the oneness. And so it really does, you know, speak to not just our own personal call as spiritual beings, but our collective responsibility as spiritual beings, our collective responsibility as those of us who attend um, centers for spiritual living, who follow, you know, this new thought wisdom, or, you know, this ancient wisdom and new thought, um, <clears throat> that that's really what, why we exist. That, as you said, like, you know, at times such as this, that I really think that this is a time 
for Centers for Spiritual Living to really um, step forward and all of us who affiliate with Centers for Spiritual Living to really step forward and be willing to engage our work and recognize that we do not do this work in isolation, that we do it for the collective whole. And in so doing, as we transmute those energies, as you're saying, I love that you say transmute rather than transform because transform is maybe like shifting the form of something, but transmuting mm -hmm. it is moving beyond form into consciousness. Mm -hmm. As we transmute that, then we then begin to free ourselves. And then we call, we call others um, into that with us. And then we are free and then we can engage again with systems to make those changes that are absolutely necessary to be made for all of us. You're right. so right. You know, one of the things that someone once told me and they meant it as an insult and I've actually thought about it and I kind of like it. They said, you're a big fish in a small pond. Um, and I thought maybe it's time for everybody to be a big fish in their small pond. Like what would it take for me to be a huge presence in wherever I am in this moment and whatever small pond I happen to be in, right? Yeah. How, what would it take for me to be a big fish? Right. Mm -hmm. And where am I playing myself small? Where am I saying, oh, I'm just one person. I can't change the world. I can't make a difference. No, be the biggest fish. I'll grow that pond. Right. Because <laughs> you'll find there is no pond. There's just <laughs> consciousness that thinks it's small. Right. And if consciousness expands and we realize that we are the blue whales of the ocean. Right. And that it's just getting bigger and bigger. And so are we. And so I'm like in the place where you are right now. There is something that needs you, mm. Mm. right? There yeah. is something that needs uniquely you. And that's one of the things I love about Science of Mind is it says that we have this ability, who we are right now is profound, perfect. And it's exactly what is needed. There is like a need in the world and you are it in the space you are because that's why you're there, right? Absolutely. It's circular, but it works for me, right? Because I'm like, okay, I'm here right now, right? I'm African American, but I'm also Native American, right? So my minor in college in political science was African American studies, but in law school, I focused on federal Indian law and I put those together and I start seeing totalities of circumstances and, and, and trends and I borrow from one to take to the other and it all works, right? It, it, there's, is there anything special about me? No, is there anything special about me? Yeah, yeah, cause I'm here. Right, this is my moment. And so it just means that I stop looking at the rest of the world to come up with a solution. And I know that it, even if it's in pulling in my neighbor's garbage bins, there's something for me to do right here. And that is my spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. My spiritual practice is not just my prayer and my meditation and my spiritual mind treatment, my reading, my contemplation. My spiritual practice is out in the world. Absolutely. And so Absolutely. we all have that. Yeah, thank you. So in the chat, what I'd love to see happen right now um, is I'd love for you to, or in the comment section, I'd love for you to go ahead and um, everybody go ahead and put in what is yours to do? What is your big whale? How are you the big fish in your little pond? And embrace your big fishness. I don't care what kind of fish it is. Maybe it's a marlin, I, you know, who knows? Maybe it's a carp, a koi, I don't know. But embrace your big fishness. Um, <clears throat> And so what is yours to do right now? What can you do today? I mean, Tammy just mentioned, you know, pulling in her neighbor's garbage cans, that that too is spiritual practice. So go ahead and um, be putting those comments there into uh, the comment box there. And we'll come back to those in a few minutes. But right now, what I'd like to do first is say, thank you, Tammy. This has been so beautiful and so rich. I am so honored and blessed to call you, you friend, um, yeah, walking this path with you, yeah. this path of ministry, this path of life. And what I would like for you, I would like to invite you to go ahead and do a spiritual mind treatment, also known as affirmative prayer for our community today, please. Absolutely. So I know that God is all there is. I know that there is a cosmic consciousness that has been with us throughout all time for the hundreds and thousands and millions of years, through all time, through all creation of time, through the creation of planets, 
through the creation of this planet, to the creation of all that is here. I know that this cosmic consciousness was always there. And I was with and one with that divine presence when all the worlds were made, when the stars were made, when all that is brought itself into being. I know that that divine consciousness is with me now and is as me now. And there can be no separation, no circumstance, no illusion that would separate me from this divine presence because it is as I am. And I know that as I am one with this, I know that I am one with everyone here, that everyone with their attention and their awareness in this moment is in that oneness. And I just bring my attention to this correlation of this divine presence right now. In this oneness, I declare that all is well. In this oneness, I declare that any limitations that would seem to call us small, I declare that any limitations that would have us be limited and chained by circumstances, anything that would inhibit the divine expression just bursting forward from us, expressing itself as beauty and kindness and, and peace and power, love, joy, all of that. I know that this divine presence is right now living and expressing and bursting forth through each of us. And it is so joyful. I'm so grateful that every person here is aware of and experiencing this expansion of their heart, this expansion of their crown, this expansion of their space, of their voice in the world. And I call it good, knowing that it is perfect. It is now. It is forever. I declare this freedom, this freedom for me, this freedom for all of us, this freedom that that lives as liquid gold in power that permeates everything that I am and it spreads out and out into the world, into my home, into my neighborhood. From where I sit, it goes into the county, the state, the planet, the world, to all the universe. I know that this capacity to love and to provide and to be divine beauty and presence and love is unlimited. And so I just bless the world. I bless all of us. I bless all that is, knowing that who we are is divine and limitless. And so I declare our eyes open to see what there is to see, to know what there is to know, to know exactly what there is for me to do. What is there exactly for each of us to do? I call it perfect. And in this space, I declare it whole, heal and one. I'm so grateful for this. I'm so grateful for this love, for this moment, for this Riverside community. So grateful for our friends and our relationships. So grateful for all the good. And I call the good so. So with this gratitude, I release this word into the universal law, into the divine presence, and to this subjective law that only says yes. And I know it is. And so it is. Love and live.